Welcome to the analysis.news. I'm Greg Wilpert. Today we're going to take a look at a vision for what a better society might look like. This is actually a continuation of a conversation that Paul Jay started with Michael Albert. So I'm going to urge our audience to take a look at that first segment with the two of them because this one will continue where that previous conversation left off. The book we're going to discuss today is called No Bosses, A New Economy for a Better World by Michael Albert and published by Zero Books last year at the end of last year in 2021. Again, I highly recommend that people check out our first interview with Michael, but just as a reminder, the book outlines what a post-capitalist and classless economy would look like, one that is based on worker and consumer councils, remuneration based on duration, intensity, and onerous of socially valued labor, balanced job complexes, and participatory economic planning. Michael is a longtime activist, author of 20 books and hundreds of articles, co-founder of ZNet and Z Magazine, and also of many other media projects. Also, he's the co-author of a vision called Participatory Economics, or Par Econ for short. Thanks for joining me today, Michael. Thank you for having me, Greg. So in the previous segment, when you and Paul discussed your book, you went over the issue of balanced job complexes, which is a central feature of participatory economics. I'd look to, like to move on from there uh, to look at other aspects of the vision. And let's take a closer look first at remuneration and then, uh, and then at participatory planning. And we'll close off with a variety of miscellaneous questions that I have. So now, just to continue basically on this, this uh, vision that you outlined in No Bosses, so why is the issue of remuneration so central? That is, assuming we achieve a society in which no one is rewarded simply for owning productive property. And I think most people on the left, at least, would agree with that idea that you shouldn't be rewarded just for owning uh, property. Uh, what's wrong with rewarding people or remunerating people on the basis of supply and demand market forces? That is, how do you propose to determine remuneration or income differently? It's a big question, um, especially since it takes us into allocation, and I think maybe you wanted to save that for a little bit later. So let me start off with the with the sort of, I, I suppose you could almost call it a value question. If you get rid of income for property, isn't it sort of simple? Don't you have to then, you know, let's come up with something in, in place of it. You do have to have something in place of it, clearly. I mean, you and I are working in the economy, and you know, we go home and we consume stuff and our budget or our income is is what governs how much we can consume and so what determines how much we earn, um, how much we get from the economy, assuming that we work. If we didn't work, then that's a whole different story. It's going to be some kind of a of an generalized income for everybody. We can get to that later. Okay, so we work. Um, and if we're not going to get paid for uh, our our property, and we're not going to get paid the way a market pays us, which is really for bargaining power. The way a market system works is, and everybody has experienced it, if you have more bargaining power, you can take more. And if you have less bargaining power, you wind up taking less. And um, so that's another thing we could reward. It's arguably a, a, a stance we could have. Let's reward bargaining power. But most people on the left, and actually I think most people, period, are going to recognize that um, th that's despicable. I mean, that's basically saying that we should all be thugs and and try and take as much as we can. Uh, and and if we're stronger, we get more, and if we're weaker, we get less. But if you're not going to do that, then what? And socialists, a lot of them have historically said, well, okay, there's an obvious and simple answer to that question. And the answer is, let's have people get back in proportion to what they put in. So in other words, if I produce a certain amount, uh, I should get back. I mean, maybe society uh, puts a certain amount of the social output to investment and puts a social amount to a certain amount to free goods. But whatever is the amount that's going to go to social personal consumption or collective consumption, group consumption, um, my income for that should be a function of how much I produce. And on the face of it, that sounds perfectly reasonable. Because after all, if I'm getting less than that, somebody else is getting some of what I did. And if I get more than that, I'm getting some of what somebody else did. And so it seems fair. It's not. And why isn't it? Well, it isn't because what determines 
let's say you and I are working in the economy, what determines how much we make, how much we add to the social product relative to one another? Well, it can depend on a lot of variables. It may be that you were born with certain genetic endowments, certain characteristics, which are very productive. And it may, or it may be that I am using some tools, some equipment that you don't have access to that's very productive. Or it may be that one of us has workmates who are more productive. It may be that just one of us is producing an item that's more valuable. Right? In any of these cases, you and I work, let's say, the same number of hours. So we, we put in four hours work. Um, one of us is going to be producing a greater amount of output by value in that four hours. Okay, so the socialist who favors this might say, yeah, sure. And, um, you know, that's sort of warranted and it's not such a big deal anyway. Well, so there's two questions. Is it warranted? Is it ethically fine? And the second question is, is it a big deal? Does it make such big differences that those differences are going to matter throughout the whole society? Uh, and the third question is, does it, does it work well regarding allocation, which you want to get to eventually? But okay, so take the first two. I don't think it's ethically warranted. I don't think it should be the case. And these are values. So I can't say this is reality. I can only say this is a value that I favor. I don't think that it ought to be the case that if I'm lucky in the genetic lottery, if I have LeBron James's body or um, uh, Adele's voice or Chomsky's brain, um, and I'm born with this stuff, I should then have on top of that great income. I should be showered with wealth on top of that. To me, that makes no ethical sense whatsoever. And uh, similarly, I don't think it makes ethical sense uh, um, if I have better tools or if I have better, you know, if I'm lucky, and that's basically what it is. It's, it's a lucky. But is, does it matter? Is the difference very much? And when, I, when some socialists would say that to me, I would say back, well, okay, do you think that um, uh, it's proper for, let's say, uh, LeBron James or Steph Curry or whoever, right, to earn 40 or $50 million a year? And they would say, no, of course not. And I would say, why not? And they would say, well, it's too much, and it's, uh, you know, they would have various reasons. And I would say, yeah, but they're underpaid. They're not overpaid. They're underpaid by your standard. Because your standard says, let's remunerate, let's provide income in proportion to the degree of, of the value of what they contribute to society. And the public, you may not like it, dear socialist, but the public likes watching LeBron James play basketball a whole lot, so much that he's being underpaid because Nike's taking some of it and the owner of the, his team is taking some of it and so on and so forth. So I think that rules out that, that norm also. Um, and if that norm is ruled out, then we need a different one. And what participatory economics proposes uh, is that we should get income for how hard we work, for how long we work, for the onerousness of the conditions under which we work, and if the work we do is socially valuable. And, and that's a norm that applies to everybody. It applies to everybody in the same way. It doesn't generate huge disparities, and it's ethically sound. And I also think it's economically sound, but we can come to that when you, when you ask about it. Yeah, I actually have a couple of follow-up questions on that, but I'm thinking maybe I should leave those until after we discuss the issue of allocation, because <clears throat> actually, well, the first, I do want to have one follow-up question, though, which is, of course, the process by which, and this might lead to the question of allocation uh, and, uh, and, and planning, um, that is, uh, how do you determine uh, these kinds of very intangible uh, factors of onerousness and intensity and things like that, and who gets to decide that? What's the process? Sure. First off, the, the last second, the last phrase, who gets to decide that? The answer to that is always the same in participatory economics, because participatory economics is an economy which purports to generate self-management. So if we work in a workplace, the workers' council is the ultimate arbiter of everything. It's, it's the decision-making body. So the, working, uh, the, the workers' council inside of a workplace is doing that. How? Your, that question remains, obviously. How is it doing it? Well, 
What did, what did I say was the variables? How long you work, that's easy, right? I mean, yeah. I, don't, I don't think that is, there's a big issue with that. How hard you work? Well, the answer to that is, A, the people you work with know how hard you work, and B, there is an indicator. So while you're not remunerated for your output, that doesn't mean your output has no bearing, right? Your output indicates whether or not you have worked long, hard, etc. And as far as onerousness of conditions, again, the workers' council has to go along. So if you and I work in a workplace and we each put in, let's say the work week is, I don't know, 30 hours. So we each put in 30 hours a week and we're working and I say um, to the group, I think I should be remunerated more. Um, or you say you think I should be remunerated less. Um, the workplace is responsible for how it does this. So that means that workplace one, maybe I would want to be in this workplace, um, says we're going to be pretty lax about this. We're going to have uh, average, average remuneration, one level above, maybe a second level above, one level below, maybe a second level below. Another workplace might decide, and it's up to the workplace and the workers' council, that they're going to operate somewhat differently. They're going to operate with... 10 levels much more highly refined above, 10 levels more highly refined below. So you can see the second one has a much, has a much more exacting task to determine where one is on that spectrum. The first workplace is pretty simple. Um, uh, the second workplace might favor that precision over the amount of time that is lost doing it. First workplace prefers saving the time. Um, I don't think honestly, that, um, and this is why I favor the first one, I guess, but I don't think that there's a, there's a real problem here at this level. There's a different question to ask, which then starts to be more difficult. Um, at this level, I think, you know, we work on work teams. We, we remember we have a plan for the workplace. We're trying to fulfill that plan. And the workforce is basically um, uh, dividing up an income that is allotted to the workplace. So the workplace is allotted a, a, an income, a, a total income to apportion to its workers. The workforce now apportions that income. So if somebody's going to get more, somebody else is going to get less um, because the total is for the workplace. And, the, and the, the, the workers are then deciding whether or not somebody has worked less time, less effort. You know, I, I like to, to sing while I work. I don't know, you know, something. And, uh, you know, and so on. Um, is it perfect? No. Of course it's not perfect. Um, but nothing is social is perfect. Is it, can one do it acceptably to all the workers? Can one have a procedure that the workers agree on? And can one then enact that in a manner that the workers uh, like, especially when the workers have chosen the procedure, and I think the answer to that is yes. The question that arises, I mean, if you want to ask something else first, the question that arises is, well, what determines that amount that goes to the workplace as a whole, right? What what determines that whole total amount? Well, maybe we should that gets us to participatory planning, and so uh, which is actually the largest chapter in your book. Um, and I think it, it actually opens up a whole bunch of related questions, not only to to the uh, process of production of goods and services, but also to the remuneration issue. So um, let's focus on that, and then I have a, some follow-up questions on remuneration as well. So how, what um, what is the how would you outline basically the um, and how participatory planning would work and what would make it better than markets or central planning. Now, that's a huge question, and uh, yeah. let's see if we can... <laughs> Let me start from where we were, and then maybe we can hone in on other parts, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. So, sure. we've got this workplace. Uh, you and I work there, and, 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 you know, I don't know, a hundred or a thousand other people work there. We now know, internally, we have worker self-management. We make decisions via the workers' council. Sometimes it allots the decisions to a team, because it mostly affects the team. Sometimes it's the whole workplace and so on. We have the balanced jobs that we talked about earlier. That's a big deal. That, that makes a difference in, in all of this, simplifying things. Um, and then uh, we're apportioning that allotted income. 
So what determines that allotted income? Why does that allotted income higher or lower? Well, participatory economics says that productive assets, that's the thing that capitalists own, basically. Productive assets are not owned by individuals. Um, they are part of a commons. And so our workplace, let's say we make bicycles, whatever, our workplace is basically saying to society, we would like to use a certain, uh, a certain share, a certain part of the productive asset <coughs> assets in the commons. And we, uh, that's, our, that's a part of our plan. We're saying, let us use those productive assets and we will produce these bicycles. And let's say that the plan is accepted. We haven't talked about that at all. Um, but let's say that it is. And so we have a, a socially accepted, a socially responsible amount of output to produce. That's what we've agreed on, right, um, in terms of bicycles, given the equipment we have to make bicycles, the number of workers that we have who are working, and so on. Okay, so let's suppose for a minute, what do we want our allocation system to do? Let's suppose for a minute that our workforce, the hundred or thousand of us or whatever it is, um, produces at a socially responsible average level, average duration, average intensity, average onerousness, because that's the nature of our workplace, let's say. Uh, so then our, our workplace would be allotted a hundred or a thousand, the number of workers times what is allotted to be the average uh, income. Let's say that we don't. Let's say that, in fact, um, and, and this is how it happens, in other words, a subset of us uh, are working less hard. A subset of us are working less hard. So as a result, our, our workplace is not, in fact, producing commensurate to the, the productive assets that we're utilizing. We're producing less. Well, what does that mean when you look at people? It means somebody, right, is um, exerting, but it's not socially responsible. Or they're not exerting, and therefore it's less, in, uh, less work. So in other words, the, the total of, of uh, duration, intensity, and onerousness that the society is, that the workplace is generating, which is what's remunerated, right, is um, less than the total number of workers times the average because some of us are are not working up to capacity we're not we, you know we're not working well or we're not literally not working for the duration etc so somehow the allocation system has to apportion the right total uh, bundle of income to the workplace it's a two-step deal. The allocation system says to our workplace, here's your income for, for your workforce. Then our workers' council says, Greg, here's your income. Michael, here's your income to everybody in place. And the simplest solution, maybe we even decided that we all trust each other, et cetera, et cetera, is everybody gets the same. But we don't have to decide that. Right? But the total that's allotted to the workplace should be the total that's warranted, the total duration, intensity, and onerousness. Yeah. Um, that's a high demand on, on the allocation system, only one of many high demands that are placed on a good allocation system as compared to markets or central planning, which just don't, they generate results, but the results don't correspond to any kind of uh, positive, virtuous values that we might have. They just generate results that are um, distorted relative to equity and um, self-management and so on. Okay, so this gets, it's not that it gets technical, but it gets detailed, right? So the allocation system has to sort of ascertain, well, in the case of a workplace, is it living up to its proposal? Or is it falling short regarding regarding the social responsibility aspect, all right? Um, and it obviously it pays attention to output to do that. You're not remunerating for output, but that doesn't mean output doesn't matter. 
Output matters. It's just that it's you don't get income for it. You get income for this other thing. But output matters to determining uh, whether or not you are um, uh, doing socially valued labor, whether or not you're using the equipment and using your own talents and your capacities um, consistent with getting a average income or more than an average income. Um, so maybe. So how yeah? So how would the participatory planning aspect work, and and, how, and who gets to decide um, whether or not these uh, how much assets are allocated or remunerated to the to the to the workplace? Participatory planning says something like this: It says um, the the workplace has a workers' council, the neighborhood has a consumers' council. So the consumers' council is basically all the people who consume in the neighborhood. Um, and um, it does partly collective consumption and partly individual consumption. And what, a, what is allocation? Allocation is a process by which uh, what people are consuming and what people are producing are brought into proximity of each other. If they're not in proximity, if much more is being produced than consumed, you've got all this waste. It's not being done. And if you, if you are short, well, then the consumers you know, are, not, are being inadequately um, fulfilled, I suppose you could say. So you want these things to be in proximity of each other. You don't want waste. You don't want surplus. Um, you don't want shortage. So that's part of what allocation does. And um, you you can you can accomplish that. One way to accomplish that is with central planning. Uh, ostensibly, very smart or well equipped people decide the outcome and instruct people what to do. That's the essence of it. Um, so that's one option. Another option is markets in which, and you know, this, this can have many sort of wrinkles, but in which uh, the consumers and the producers are competing and which they're all trying to get the best that they can. And they try to, to arrive at outcomes that they prefer um, by applying the power that they have at their disposal. So that's another option. Um, so participatory economics says there's a third option. There's a way to do this which is cooperative, not competitive, and which has no top and no bottom, no center, no um, elite imposing its will upon the process. And so what's the process? The process is um, the consumer councils are making proposals. What are they proposing? They're proposing collective consumption and individual consumption, the sum of it. Um, so they're, they're collective, you know, all told they're proposing what, people, what society wants to consume, um, but each individual is proposing for its constituency. And the producer councils um, are, producing what's, are proposing what society wants to produce in light of um, uh, the productive assets that are available. And so each workplace is proposing that, and you sum it all up in an industry, and you get the proposal for all total bicycles, not just our workplace's bicycles, and then for the whole economy. Okay, so if, if you just did that, they wouldn't match, right? So that's the allocation problem. There's no particular reason to think that the sum total of what everybody was proposing to produce and everybody's proposing to consume would in some sense, you know, would be in proximity of each other. Why should that be? It wouldn't be. So um, what you have to have is a process that brings them into proximity. And the process is that there's what uh, the economists call it iterations. There are rounds of planning. So the, the workers' councils make a proposal. The consumers' councils make a proposal. What are they making it based upon? Well, they're making it based upon prices. If I'm a consumer, I know that ultimately I, need to cons I, I can consume consistent with my budget in other words, my income, in light of prices. If I was only consuming bicycles, I could consume, you know, 47 bicycles or 400 bicycles because it sums up to my income. So I know what my income is. This is not unfamiliar. This is true in any economy. I, I know what my income is or I, I know what it's likely to be at the end of the planning process. I know what prices are or likely to be at the end of the planning process. So we'll come to how I know them in a minute. And so I make a proposal based upon that. And on the producer side, it's rather similar. I know uh, um, what, what my workplace is utilizing, uh, 
I know again what the costs are, and I know what the the price of my output is, right? And now it's a little different than being within my budget on the consumer side. On the producer side, I have to have the the value of my product commensurate to the cost of everything that I'm putting into it, right? That's that's what's socially responsible. It's not socially responsible for me as a workplace to be using lots of equipment and have lots of workers and produce nothing. That's socially irresponsible. Um, in the same way as it would be socially irresponsible for me as a consumer to consume a ton and not have done anything to warrant it. Okay, so the planning process has a second um, component. It has workers' councils and consumers' councils, and now it has something that's called an iteration facilitation board. What's that? That's uh, a bunch of people, um, or it could be a bunch of equipment, actually, um, which basically looks at prior activity and proposes a guess. That's what it is. It's called indicative prices. It, pro it proposes a guess as to what prices are going to wind up. So when we make our first proposal, uh, when I when I sit down to say to make my first consumption program, proposal, I know what I did last year. I know what my expected income is. I know what my expected prices are, and I make a proposal. Um, at the workers at the, the work workers council side, it's pretty much the same thing. I know what uh, uh, prices are. I know what costs are. I know what I did last year. I have all these sort of, and and so I make a proposal for what what to do this year, or my workers' council makes a proposal. They don't match, right? So in the first iteration, we don't have a plan. We have, we have some information. That's what we have. We, I get some information that the thing I'm producing is in undersupply. People want more of it, let's say. Um, and I get a new set of prices uh, for the second iteration, for the second round of planning. I get updated prices guesses at what the final price is going to be and same thing on the consumer side and so this goes on for a number of rounds not 200 uh, you know ballpark seven six in about there and we arrive at a plan now why is this any good well if the prices are drastically weird and wrong then then it's not good but if the prices are a reflection of what we could call full social costs and benefits, personal, collective, ecological, so it takes into account what are called externalities. If the prices do that, and if the producers are arriving at a responsible proposal, they're properly utilizing their assets to provide what's socially desired, and the consumers are arriving at a socially responsible proposal, a, a proper level of uh, consumption, then we have a good plan. Um, and, and in fact, you know, economists have various ways of figuring out whether something is desirable or not. Honestly, I mostly am not particularly partisan to those things. But if you use those approaches, then this does as as well as the idealized market system, except much better because the prices are actually real. Um, and that, now this would introduce new problems. How do you how do you get that ecological thing in there? And we still have this question of well, where in this came the determination of the amount of income that each workplace gets? Well, I wanted to follow up on the question of <clears throat> of the how this is actually different from markets. I mean. <clears throat> don't markets actually also basically just uh, aren't they also an iteration process between supply and demand uh, and so how is uh, what you're proposing actually different of course yeah you end up with a plan but that's kind of like you could say well the, the company that's making the widgets uh, has a plan for making X number of widgets right, based right. on the information they got from the market there's a sense in which one way to extrapolate from that question is to say what do we have to do to markets Right? to make them an acceptable, remember, I, an acceptable mechanism, process, allocation mechanism, for getting consumption and production to be in proximity to each other. 
and to fulfill our values. Remember what our values were, self-management, solidarity, diversity, um, uh, equity, so on. Well, you'd have to do quite a lot to markets. In fact, I think you'd have to turn it into participatory planning. That's what would wind up happening if you sort of step by, if God could come down and step by step tinker with markets and make them fairer and fairer and fairer. Why? Well, this is gets us into markets, but I guess you want to do that. So um, what's what's wrong with markets is multiple things. So one thing that's wrong with markets is that they they are a system in which my benefit is your loss and vice versa. We are actually, when I'm selling or buying, I'm trying to, uh, what, what is it, sell cheap and buy dear. I guess that's, yeah. So in other words, each participant is trying to do the best they can for themselves in a manner, right? And um, so it's producing a kind of individuality. It's producing a kind of competitiveness. Now, that might sound abstract, and who cares? But look around. You know, look at society and ask yourself, this is a big deal, right? This is a, a, a fundamentally important institution in society causing people to be narrow, to be individualist, to not give a damn about the other person, and not because they're evil, but because that's the way the system works. That's the way markets work. They don't work if you behave otherwise. Nice guys finish last, basically. So that's one feature. Another feature in markets is that markets don't... In markets, there's a buyer and a seller, and the buyer and the seller are entering into the transaction. And so the will of the buyer and the will of the seller is entering into the transaction. So one, one problem is that they're out for themselves in a narrow individualist way. But that's not the only problem. Another problem is that it's not the case that the buyer and the seller are the only people who are affected by a transaction, right? When, when we do a transaction and, uh, I don't know, um, you, you get a car, right? Uh, okay, so you're affected and you get the car. And the producers are affected. They sell the car. Um, but everybody who breathes the pollution that your car spits out is also affected. right? And that's not the only way people are affected. They're also affected because, for instance, the steel that went into the car didn't go into something else. So now let's assume that we collectively consume guided missiles. The guided missile steel didn't go into building you know, transit or whatever. right? It's, so, so it isn't just... It's partly the external, uh, what are called externalities, I implications for those beyond the, you know, the immediate transaction. It's partly that, even, even more than that, every transaction in some sense affects everyone, right? Because in any transaction, in any producing and then consuming, stuff is being used, it's put to a certain purpose, and it's not put to another purpose. And so everybody is sort of impacted by this choice. And we want self-management, right? So we want people to have a say in decisions in proportion to the degree they're affected. Again, an outrageously, seemingly too demanding demand to put on the institution. But we believe in it. And so what we're saying is, is that the process of these workers and consumers councils um, Making proposals, you're, you're proposing your consumption, you're proposing your production. I'm not dictating it. Nobody is, right? Um, and then mediating that and refining that in light of information that, re that returns, right, is in fact taking into account other people's inclinations and other people's desires. Um, it's not arriving at it by the amount of power that you have. It's not arriving at it, you know, arriving at it by ignoring the environmental effects, say. It's taking all this stuff into account, and it's all sort of playing back into your choice as you modify your choice. Um, it, you know, if you say a market is just people producing stuff and getting stuff, right, and with a budget and with attention to impact, then every allocation system is a market. And that's what people in society say to us. And so it removes the, the issue of are markets good or bad, 
do we can we can we do better than markets? Well, there's no such thing, right? If if that's what a market is, then every economy is going to have that. But a market is not that. A market is buyers and sellers competing, trying to get ahead at the, ex at the expense of the other, all based on short-term valuations, all based on prices that are a product of bargaining power, et cetera, et cetera. And as a result, it has various negative effects, which we can see all around us. Does participatory planning do better? Well, that's an open question, I suppose, until maybe it exists. But its advocates argue that, yes, participatory planning manages to um, uh, create a, an allocation process that's consistent with the other institutions. Let me just go on one second more to give an example of what it means for an allocation process to not be consistent. In the earlier session that was done, we talked about balanced jobs. And so the purpose of that was to get rid of a, uh, of a class division between those who monopolize empowering circumstances and those who are doing or the opposite. They're, they're, in, they're in work roles which are disempowering. And the claim is that that's not just any old class division, but it can become a, a fundamental class division where one class, the empowered class, is the ruling class, and the other class, disempowered class, is subordinate class, let's say 20 over 80. Okay, so um, we don't want that. So we have balanced job complexes so that our activity in the economy does not distinguish us into two groups one that's empowered and one that isn't empowered. It instead leaves us all comparably empowered. But let's say on top of that we put uh, central planning or we put markets. If we put these kinds of allocation on top of balanced job complexes, there's a, con there's a contradiction. It is there, this is not compatible. Why not? Well, with central planning, it's sort of obvious. The central planners don't want to negotiate with the workforce. They want to impose on the workforce. And so the, I, the, the, whole, the whole logic of the thing is that the central planners are authorities and that they want authorities inside the workplace to negotiate with because they sure as hell don't want to negotiate with a whole workers' council. They, they're, they're sending instructions, and they want the instructions to be met. So we know historically that that's sort of what happens. But the more interesting one is the, is the market. Why would markets be inconsistent with balanced job complexes? And it, I think it goes something like this. If you have markets, then you have competition. If we produce bicycles and somebody else produces bicycles, we're, we're competing for, for market share. We're competing to become the larger bicycle firm, the firm that can generate more income. Remember, income with markets is a function of, uh, not of duration, intensity, and onerousness, but basically what you can take. And so if the, if the bicycle firm can engineer its way into getting more gross revenues and essentially surplus, um, then it does better. And so its workforce wants to do that. Um, how do you do that? Well, the well, workplace across town is producing bicycles, and your workplace is producing bicycles. You, you do things which let you get ahead. What kind of thing lets you get ahead? Dumping your waste on your neighborhood. Um, speed up. Um, not having child care. Um, turn it, not having air conditioning for anybody except maybe a few, and so on. And you know, I'm not sure everybody agrees with me about this, but I think that what happens in this kind of circumstance is that the the workplace, let's say we even have workers' councils, so we have markets and workers' councils and balanced job complexes. Still in all, my workplace has to compete because it's markets. And so it has to make these sort of horrible decisions, decisions that hurt the workforce. Well, who's going to make those decisions? Right? Who's good at making those decisions and who's going to make them? If we don't make them and somebody else does, we get screwed. If we do make them, we screw ourselves. Um, I think what happens is we have to find people who are well adjusted and, and <laughs> who are poorly adjusted, I suppose I should say, who are of a mindset and of a skill set to make those kinds of choices, to cut costs, 
to increase output, regardless of input on the of impact on the workforce. So we hire people like that. So we go to the you know nowadays uh, you know we would go to the Wharton School or the Harvard Business School or something, and we hire somebody who has been socialized into not caring about fucking other people over, and we we hire them. We put them in offices and we say, okay, screw us at, because it's in our interest, screw us at work to get us more income and to keep us alive competing with other firms so we don't go under. And so we, we, the, the logic of markets right, disrupts the, the equity of income, but it also it disrupts the classlessness of self-management. Um, and that's how me, an allocation system can screw up uh, your aspirations. Let me get back to the question of how you incorporate values <clears throat> at this point, because I could imagine a situation where, uh, let's say, um, just, you know, let's say your bicycle factory or whatever, and you were mentioning earlier that you wouldn't want them to pr dump their waste uh, in the community. And so obviously the community has an interest in preventing that and uh, in the process of coming up with a plan, presumably they would take that into account. But what if, let's say, that um, that factory just dumps it in a different community, <laughs> ships it abroad or who knows? Uh, how do you how do you then take a, uh, take the ecological value, for example, into account? Why is the factory uh, doing to, that? Presumably to offer a lower price and to perhaps get more income. Why? Because everybody wants to have more stuff. But they're not going to get more stuff. See, in, in, this is one of the peculiarities, I suppose you could say, of participatory planning uh, or of participatory economics. It's, it's, there's, there's these two things. There's your productivity, right? And there's your duration, intensity, and onerousness of socially valued labor. They're not the same. So let's say that you have a balanced job complex, but a, you know, a, a part of that is, I don't know, doing brain surgery, right? And um, I have a balanced job complex, and a part of it is, I don't know, um, uh, I, I don't know, um, in, inside of a workplace, um, being involved in uh, planning the allocation of stuff uh, during the workday. Um, or making something um, that is empowering, but in no way as socially valuable as brain surgery, right? So you're going to get, in some systems, you're going to get a higher income because your, your, your brain surgery is so valuable. And, and I'm going to get a lower income because my violins that I'm working on are less valuable. Um, in participatory economics, that isn't the case. Right, I'm going to get income for duration, intensity, and onerous. You're going to get income for duration, intensity, and onerous. But wait, isn't that allocated by the workplace? In other words, depending on how much income that workplace generates on the whole, isn't it? That was the thing that I, in the last little section that we did, I left for less. Okay, but um, uh, the the it's there is no such thing, right, as um, me getting twice as much for the similar duration, intensity, and onerousness, or at least that's the claim, right? In other words, there's no way to aggrandize self. There's no way to enlarge one's income beyond the norm that is stipulated. Now, you're right. If society misallocates to a workplace, if society were to allocate uh, I, I'm in one bicycle factory and you're in another bicycle factory. So your bicycle factory dumps its crap on the neighborhood, or maybe it takes it around the corner and dump it, right? And mine doesn't, right? And so the, the idea here is, is your factory in a position to get a greater income allotment from the allocation system than mine is? And the answer is no. Because, first of all, the the... Now, this gets us to another step. We probably shouldn't have used dumping. But in any case, in the case of dumping, you get charged for the dumping, right? So, in other words, you, you, that, that's part of your cost. In, in the same way, you, you use uh, some input, steel. 
So your workplace is charged for the steel that you use, that you get from someplace else. Your workplace generates um, some pollution. Your workplace is charged for that also. Uh, it's, not, it's not like a product where you're benefiting from the product. It's a product, pollution, right? But the product is a negative thing, and you're charged for that. And indeed, the income goes to the, the people who are suffering the pollution. Um, if it, 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 it's a little bit difficult, but the idea is the planning process, right, um, arrives at, let's look at it now as a whole. So the planning process arrives at a plan. That means it's arrived at essentially an average income, right? Um, and, and it, it now has to apportion, say, to the bicycle industry as compared to some other industry. Well, if everybody, if everything is, you know, just level, then the bicycle industry gets the total number of people in the bicycle industry times the average income, and so does the violin industry, yeah? But if it's not level, let's say the, vi the bicycle industry is more onerous, then you'd get a, an, an, an added element to your income, uh, to your industry income. Or let's say that... Um, during the course of the of the year, the in, the bicycle industry fails to fulfill its plan, so it's not doing the socially valued amount of labor that it was that was an accept, was the average. It's doing less, so then it gets less again, right? It's it's not that you Greg did less; it's that the whole damn industry did less. Um, so now the industry, so the society is basically, in a sense, you could say the, the, the plan, society, is apportioning to industries, income allotment, right? And that has to add up to the total for the whole society. Now inside your industry, uh, and there's an industry federation of councils, inside your industry, um, again, there's an apportionment to what? To all the factories in the industry. Right? And so, once again, now the industry has a certain amount that's allotted to it, and let's just for the sake of discussion say it's average or whatever, right? Um, so it's a total amount. Now, the industry is allotting to every factory inside the industry or to every workplace inside the industry. And again, if, if some workplaces are, you know, are underproducing, are, are underutilizing the, the productive assets of the social commons, then they're going to get less income on grounds that they're not doing, uh, they're not fully doing socially uh, valued labor. They're either not working, or they're working poorly, one or the other, right? And so they would get less. And so, and and then the next step is, um, it's a similar kind of step. At the total level, there's an apportionment to industries, um, and the total level has to have some notion. And none of this is perfect. It can't be. But the total level has some industry, some notion if some of the industries are, you know, more onerous or less onerous. Now, at the industry level, there might be that too. Maybe there's a bicycle factory in, uh, I don't know, Alabama where the temperature is really hot. And there's a bicycle factory in Ohio where the temperature isn't that hot. And maybe it's, you know, maybe that's a real issue. And uh, the one is more onerous than the other. Anyway, the industry has to apportion among workplaces, and then the workplace apportions among its workforce. And at every step, it's the same criteria, remuneration for duration, intensity, and onerousness of socially valued labor. But you don't have a situation where, as an individual, now let's look at the individual level. Right, you want to aggrandize yourself. So how do you do that? Well, you can claim to do stuff that you didn't do. So you can cheat, right? Try and cheat somehow. Or you can do a whole lot. Well, you can't do a whole lot unless your workmates agree because it affects them. You can't you can't take on all the work in the workplace. You you can't do that, right? You have to get agreement. And you can't cheat because you, your workplace is going to know. You know, maybe you can cheat a little bit, I don't know, but but the workplace is going to to know if you're just, you know, exaggerating. You're, you're saying, you know, I, I did 60 hours, you all did 30 hours, and everybody can see you didn't do 60 hours, right? And not only that, even if you did do 60 hours, you didn't generate 
double the output of everybody else. All right, so there are a lot of indicators which preclude, and this presumes that just solidarity wouldn't preclude it, which I think it would, but um, these kinds of behaviors. It's a little like, it's a whole different thing, but what if, uh, what if you're a tennis player and you're as good as Roger Federer, okay? And so you, and so you look around and you say to yourself, well, you know, this is nice, but let's get real. Um, I'm special and I want more income. So I'm going to set up a black market. I'm going to sell my tennis capacity on the side, right? And I'm going to try and aggrandize myself. Well, what happens in a participatory economy? First of all, you have to have tennis courts. You have to have tennis balls. You have to have, etc. Not so simple because all work is done in a workers' council, right? You're going to do it on the side, on the sly. Next thing that's a problem is how does anybody, how do you get this income? Where's it coming from? Notice income was coming from the plan. It's not coming from a bunch of people who are coming and paying you. So you say to a bunch of people, uh, pay me, and you can play with me. Um, and, you, and there's a lot of people who want to play, right? They want to play with Roger Federer because you're so damn good. Um, so they're willing to give you stuff. So they give you chickens and whatever. Um, and so you're... you're well, I mean, but don't they also have their own money that they get well, they from have, their work? Well, they have... Not particularly, not in the modern version, right? In other words, they, they have an income, right? So everybody has an income. So I have an income, let's call it 100. And I can spend my 100 on stuff. And I've planned on what to spend on. Another feature is that that changes over the course of the year. So the system has to be able to accommodate that. But it does. Um, but so I have that, that amount of, of spending capacity. But it's probably just on a, on a computer. It's on like a credit card. right? And so I can't pay you with a credit card. I mean, I can't. But, let, but it doesn't really matter. Even if I can transfer to you, which I don't think I'd be able to, but let's say I can transfer to you a piece of my bargaining, I mean a piece of my income. So now you, Roger, have a big income. Um, you don't have Roger's <laughs> capitalist world income, but let's say you have twice what you would have had or three times what you would have had even. Now what do you do? Well, in our current society... Being rich is no big deal, right? That is to say, you can do whatever you want with that income because when you drive around in your Ferrari or whatever it is that you're doing, it's no big deal. Lots of people do that, right? In a participatory economy, that's not true. If you spend a really high income publicly, everybody knows you cheated. Everybody knows you did something wrong. Now, I don't even think you could get to that point. But if you got to that point, Right? It's still hard. You have to enjoy it in your basement because it's clearly a violation. So there, there are things like that. Like, for instance, we didn't put that in participatory economics. We just discovered that after we had this, this picture of what this thing was in our head. We discovered well, this is a peculiar and interesting attribute. It sort of makes it hard to cheat. It makes it hard to it isn't just that it's oriented against that. It isn't just that it sort of tries to create social relations and solidarity contrary to that. It even makes it hard to do. And mm -hmm. it's true inside the workplace also. Right? So you and your fellow workers. I mean, if you're going to be an asshole, how do you get away with that? It's not obvious. Right? And these are all minuscule, just as a sidebar, these are all small... Um, negatives compared to what's the normal and commonplace in existing allocation systems and economies. But even these small negatives are very hard to to implement and have uh, in a participatory well, I mean, economy. Go ahead. I, I want to ask a whole bunch of follow-up questions, but um, we've gone on for pretty long now, so I want to conclude this part, and we'll do another segment um, where we cover the follow-up questions that I have. So so first of all, I just want to uh, <clears throat> remind people to take a, uh, take a look at the first part uh, that was done with Paul Jay. This is part two, and we're going to conclude that now. I'm speaking to Michael Albert, author of the book No Bosses, A New Economy for a Better World. Uh, thanks again, Michael, for having joined me today, and I urge you to turn, tune in, everybody, for the third part, which is going to follow right after this one. Thank you. 
And thank you to our audience for tuning in to the analysis.news. If you like our, like our videos and podcasts, please make sure to visit the analysis.news website and make a donation there so we can continue providing the service. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and or to the podcast.